That's what we're talking about today, becoming a Joshua generation. You guys ready for that? Yeah? All right, awesome. Yeah, let's get the lights. Let's get this going. Thank you, Daniel. Love you, brother. Good stuff. So everybody got an outline, hopefully. I'm going to try to run through this relatively quickly. We're going to really be based out of one main scripture, and it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So if you got some, I guess children's church is being dismissed. You guys go. Have a great time. Awesome. Well, here's the thing. We're, we're really going to take some lessons from the wilderness. What can we learn? Okay, because 1 Corinthians 10 gives us a strong warning, some strong language about these things were written. They went through what they went through, the Israelites in the wilderness, for a reason, so that it would teach you something as an example, as instruction for us today, as disciples of Christ today, as believers on this journey. We have a journey to go on as well, to go through as well. And so we're going to look at this scripture, and there's so much in it, we're going to try to unpack it a bit. But there's some lessons that we need to learn from the wilderness because we don't want to wander around aimlessly and test God and fall into temptation and complain and grumble like they did, do we? We can have our wilderness seasons for sure, but we don't want to continue to circle around that mountain over and over and over again. We need to learn. We need to respond. We need to position ourselves. Because there is a river that's flowing. There is an outpouring that's coming. And, and, and it's here. And there's pockets of it. And there's signs of it here and there. And it's only going to accelerate. And it's only is going to increase. As darkness and evil and all that increases, so is the glory and the power of God to match that. Okay? As a witness, as a sign and a wonder for the salvation of souls is what it's about. But we need to be those vessels, once again, that are positioned, that can receive the rain, that can receive the river, that can feed the river. Right? Not just feast on the river and say, isn't this so great, but can actually contribute and feed the river. Does that make sense? That's what's going on. So we, we need to think about, once again, what are we handing the next generation? What are we depositing in them? What are we modeling before them and in front of them? Are we investing in them? So Michael's, uh, Michael and Anthony work with the youth, and I was able to go and had the privilege of speaking to the youth this past Wednesday, and this was pretty much the message that I brought to them. I mean, I've added to it and changed it up a little bit. So I was speaking to them about how they needed to step up like Joshua did, right? I was handed over from Moses to him that all that generation before that had wandered for 40 years, the Bible says they died off. Joshua and the younger ones, they got handed the baton and said, now you guys go and take the land. But I want to say this, we need to hand the baton. Kaylin has talked about this many times, there, a transition, that, that, that there's a generational thing going on. And God is a generational God, right? He's the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he wants to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, right? And we've got a fatherless generation who's so confused. And is inundated with wrong, perverse messages on social media and Hollywood and everything else. And I already touched on that this morning. But if that's the case, if that's the environment that they're in, we've got to present something to them that's so much better, that's so much more powerful, that anchors them to their identity in Jesus Christ. That we affirm them, that we accept them. Even though they've got some, some issues and some things to work out, many have been abused, many have been molested, many have been in poverty or in addiction and seen all kinds of crazy things, exposed to pornography and all this sexual perversion and whatever else. And we've got to have a purity. We've got to have, you know what? I used to say this to the youth all the time. I could talk to you about, you know, partying and alcohol and drugs and this and that and illicit relationships and all of that. But unless I present to you a relationship with Jesus Christ that far surpasses that, a journey, a destiny that's so much greater it's not going to do anything for you. If I can say, no, 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 don't do this, don't do that. God, God wants you to do this. Does that make sense? It's got to be something else that they can grab a hold of. That's real. That they can taste. That they can see. That someone has said no to all of that already and has no desire at all to go back to any of that. That happened for me in my college years. A lot of, a lot of different things happened. And I finally really came to a place of surrender and said, I, I don't want to be half in and half out. I don't want to numb myself with partying and alcohol and all this other stuff. And God, if you'll take me back, if you'll have mercy on my soul, I want to be all in. And he heard my cry. He had mercy on me. 
And I've never wanted to go back to those days. I've never wondered what I missed out on. I never, I never want to go back to any of that, ever. That's not, that's not my desire at all. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. When I finally got broken and said, I don't want any of that, none of that will ever satisfy. All that does is leave me more alone and more empty, more broken. It will never fill me. And so oftentimes I would tell the younger people, hey, I could kind of, you know, bring things down and water it down a bit. We could make this fun. We could make it entertaining. We could, we could do this and that. And I said, but you'd never be challenged to grow any further than where you're at right now. I could keep you right here at this level, but I'm going to bring it up here at this level because I want you to reach for that. I want to stretch you. I want you to get your vision of that. Does that make sense? And that applies to us as adults as well. That's my whole thing. We can't just say, well, the young generation needs to get it together, you know, or whatever it is, or they listen to the wrong music, or they don't dress right, or they do this and that. What are we doing to offer them an alternative? What are we showing them? Not just talking, but walking something out. So let's, okay, that's enough of that. Let's get into the scripture now. I think you know where my heart is on this thing. I mean, I'm not a youth pastor anymore, but I am a youth pastor. <laughs> As we all should be, really. It is about the kids. They're the future. And we always want to hand them something more than what we had. We want to do whatever we can to save them from the heartache and the jacked up stuff that we went through. We don't want them to have to experience that pain, do we? Now, they do have to make their own decisions and, and make their own mistakes. But whatever we can do to lead them and guide them and cushion them from all that, give them a foundation and understanding, a vision, a, right? That's what we want to do. But in their mistakes and in their immaturity, that's the thing. They're, 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 uh, many of them are sincere. They're, 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 they really are trying. They might fail a lot, but we don't need to write them off and be like, you know what, you're done, it's over. You've proven that you're... A loser. Or what? No! I mean, no! We've all strayed away. And oftentimes, it's, it's, it's how we respond, how we show grace. And, and also, and say, hey, now, there's got to be some accountability here. You know, or whatever. It's, it's both and. It's not one or the other. And that's what God did with the people in the wilderness. So let's Let's not wander for 40 years like they did, right? I'm just now, I'm 40 years old, and I've been wandering for a while. Maybe I'm preaching this to myself more than anything else. What am I going to do with the rest of my 40 years or whatever? Jesus is probably going to come back before you, but whatever. That's okay. Actually, yeah, it's gone. I maybe I don't want to make it to 80. That'd be sad. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, it says, Now these things happened as examples for us. Once again, the children of Israel in the wilderness. So that we would not crave evil things. Isn't that interesting? They craved evil things as they indeed craved them. So here's, here's they're just going to talk about sort of this breakdown of, of what they were craving and then how it led to this progression. It says, do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down, does this not describe America? To eat and drink, and then they rose up to play. The Bible says, you know, there's that, there's that scripture that says, let's just eat and drink and be merry because tomorrow we're going to die anyway. Why does it matter? Let's just have fun while we can. And Paul's trying to say, no, 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 no. You're children of the day and sons of light, not of darkness. You need to sober up and wake up. You're not like them. It's different for you. America has been so lulled to sleep with all her busyness, all the conveniences, all the self-gratifying things, all the meism that's out there on Instagram and Twitter and everything else. Let's go Elon Musk. Take it over. Something needs to happen with Twitter. He's one of the only ones that's deciding to try to swim upstream. He's one of the only guys. He's a major influential guy. I don't want to you know, get into too, too many current events and social whatever, but... But we need to, maybe, maybe he is an eccentric, you know, weirdo or whatever, but he is saying, let's maintain some freedom here. Let's let people express their thoughts and opinions and not censor it. And not only talk about one side or the other and create a narrative that, that controls the population. At least he's saying something that makes some kind of sense. But America, and, and this is what we were talking about, the vow of David. We were talking about this tabernacle of David reality where he said, I, 
I didn't want to go into my house and I didn't want to sleep on my bed and I didn't want to give any rest to my eyes until I found a resting place for God. In America, we've got, some, in other words, he was talking about, I don't want all my conveniences and all my domestic life and all my different things and entertainment and my, my pleasures and my comfort. I want to put that aside for something so much greater. I want to dedicate my life in that way. And so I'm still challenging you uh, as, as a Tabernacle of David house, as that's our, our mandate, our calling, challenge you in this way as well to become a Joshua generation. In America, I'm telling you, the American dream, all the different messages that are out there, it's so deceptive. It's, it, and it's appealing, and it sounds good, and there's all this different language of tolerance and equality and all of this. And it's absolutely dark and demonic and twisted and perverse. It's not grounded in the Bible. It's not grounded in the God of the Bible. It's not grounded in anything other than power yeah. and pride of man. Period. That's it. Okay. So, no, sorry about that. I just, you know, that's, I had to say that. Nor are we, to, it goes on now, nor are we to commit sexual immorality, immorality in general, as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. 23,000 fell in one day. Nor are we to put the Lord to the test. So look at this. Idolatry, immorality, putting the Lord to the test as some of them did, and were killed by the snakes. Then it says this. Nor grumble or complain as some of them did. Is there anything worse than just somebody that grumbles and complains all the time? Than a negative Nancy, than a Karen that just wants to point out how horrible the service is and this and that, I can't get this and the weather and whatever else. Just constantly... Wasn't the weather beautiful yesterday, though? I don't know if you guys got to get out at all. Man, what a wonderful day it was yesterday. And then, of course, allergies, and so that ruins. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be a Karen, but I'm just <laughs> taking a field. It's going to be okay. <laughs> but I just can imagine these people who, who God did all these miracles. Part of the Red Sea, there was a, a cloud by day and fire by night. And water coming from a rock and manna from heaven, and yet they complained. What would it have been like to be Moses to deal with those people? No wonder he struck the rock. I would have struck a bunch of people, not just a rock. Yeah, I'll help you out with your situation. Take this. Get out of my face. You're the hundredth person that I've dealt with. Can you remember Moses had to deal with all the people and judge between them? What kind of no wonder he was the most humble man on the planet? Until Jesus came along, Moses wrote that about himself. <laughs> I would have too. I was dealing with what he dealt with. But imagine the Lord thinking, look what I've done for you. And you're going to grumble and complain? And say you wish you were back in Egypt? Back in bondage? Do we as believers, do we say that? Do we become so familiar and so whatever and take things for granted that we become like that? How much does that grieve the heart of God? So the first thing here then is they craved evil things. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what are we craving? What are our dreams and desires? What are our priorities? What are the things that we think about and focus on day after day? Right? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, right? And mind and strength. How are we loving God with our mind? What are we thinking about? What are we focused on? All of our strength. Where are we putting our energies towards? What are, what, where are we spending our time? And I'm asking myself these questions as well. I've got to constantly monitor and adjust. And can get busy doing good things in my ministry or doing other things in my life. I have to constantly come back to adjusting myself. Back to the plumb line of the heart of God. The intimacy with Him. What is bringing me joy and satisfaction? Am I, am I getting filled up or am I just continuing to pile on things and just go and figure it out and manage on my own? I gotta let some of that stuff go. I gotta get in the presence of God. I got to hear his voice. I've got to have his refreshing. I've got to have his insight and his wisdom instead of doing stuff in my own strength and my own mindset. That's challenging, is it not? It is for me. So that's the thing. Sometimes, you know, those inward desires, if we're not careful. We feed that, right? And that continues to build us and we feel like it's happy. We feel like we're happy about it. We feel like it's whatever. But in the end, it ends up being a chasing after the wind, right? In the end, we find out, where am I at now? Why have I been going? Because you had all these things that were driving you you didn't even think about. You didn't even know. 
That's why we have the Holy Spirit who can bring these things up to the surface. Show us our innermost thoughts and desires. That's what the Word of God does, does it not? It's sharper than, two, uh, than any two-edged sword. It's able to pierce through thoughts and emotions. Divide between spirit and flesh. Because if we don't get those cravings and those desires and those things in check, we know what the Bible says in, in 1 John, right? It, it mentions these things. What does it mention? It, it mentions the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, pride in our possessions. And it says that if those things are operating in you, guess what's not operating in you? The love of the Father. Ah. If you're, if you're, I'm telling you, man, this is serious. The inner workings of your heart. What, what is driving you to get out of bed every day and to do the things that you do? To dress the way that you dress, to talk to the way that you talk to people, whatever. What is behind all of that? Because if you're not careful, you'll find yourself wandering around, circling the same mountain, and wondering, where's God at? What's going on? How am I continuing to stay? Because you're being driven by those things. And then you'll go down this progression. Starts out, so the progression is this. It's, it's idolatry, all right? And we're going to define these things here in a minute. Leads to immorality, which leads to putting God to the test, or you become hardened in your heart. You become stubborn about things, and just like, I don't care, you're apathetic, you're whatever, you're numb. To eventually becoming bitter to where all you do is complain about things. That's the progression. Idolatry, immorality, hardness of heart to bitterness. Unfortunately, there's a lot of bitter people out there. Many of them are believers. But once again, we can't be handing this generation something that is bitter and that is religious and that is artificial and that is surface, right? That's plastic. It's got to be real. It's got to be deep. It's got to be that whole reality that David talked about, about how your love is better than mine. Right? Yeah. That whole thing. We've got to tap into that river. So idolatry. What is idolatry then? So it's anything that we put before God. Something or someone that we look to or depend on that is a substitute for God. That's in your outline right there. It becomes a substitute. Instead of going to God, instead of finding your, your source in Him and your strength in Him, your ability to make it through, your, your coping mechanism becomes whatever it is. Whether it's a substance or a person or whatever, it's a substitute for God. You take those things to Him. It's what we should be doing, but instead you take it to something or someone else. And so it's the, the, what it is, is it, once you substitute you put something else in the place of God, what happens is you dethrone Him. It's the dethronement of God in our hearts and lives by holding something else in a higher esteem or giving it more of our love and attention. Think about that. <laughs> this is, I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road, people. If He's the Lord, He's Lord of all, or He's not Lord at all. He's on the throne or He's not. He's ruling as King overseeing everything and we're in submission to Him and underneath His authority or we're outside of that doing our own thing. That's it. It's a question of where are we substituting things? How are we dethroning God? If we're holding something else in a higher esteem, if that's the thing that we go to first, if that's what we look to first, if that's what we... That's where we're getting whatever it is our jollies from. Whatever word you want to use. If that's the thing that's medicating us, if that's the thing that's putting a band-aid on it, because that's all it's doing, just temporarily relieving something or burying it or whatever it is, covering it up, but it's not healing it, it's not dealing with it, it's not submitting it, it's not allowing the Lord to get a hold of it. So idolatry, man, this is a, this is a crazy thing because, once again, in America... We justify ourselves in so many different ways. And we have so many different options, so much entertainment, so much whatever. And we have so much, we only have so much time in a day, and we only have so much energy, we only have so much capacity. And how have we divided that between all these things in the world and in our lives? Once again, 
It's okay. We get into certain seasons where things are going on with our kids or this or that. You know, but once again, we have to realign ourselves. We have to be mature enough to recognize, okay, I'm in this season. I've got I've to pause for a second. I've got to get back with the Lord. I gotta, does that make sense? This is just really simple one-on-one stuff, but we get so caught up. And we just think, well, well God's going to wink at it. And we can just continue on and it's all good or whatever else. And then before too long, we find out that we haven't been in the Word. We haven't been spending time in prayer. And I'm talking to myself as well, even as a pastor. I have the same struggle. I'm a human being just like you. I have life just like you. I'm not some kind of superhuman. I'm a weak and broken guy that needs to. I need these, these, these worship services. I need, the, I need you guys. This is where we get encouraged. This is where we get built back up. Where we get, oh, wait a minute. I was off track. Why was I focusing on that? I need to get back here. This snaps me out of it week to week. Now, I don't, I don't necessarily depend on it as, as necessarily. That, I mean, this is helpful to me. It's beneficial. But I've got to have my own relationship with the Lord. That's right. right? That's what I'm saying. Or else I've entered into some idolatry. And I've got to, I've got to cast those idols aside. Because then what will happen is it will lead to immorality, right? Which is anything outside the will, design, or purpose of God. Think about this. When something is twisted or perverted to be done or used in a way that was not the original intention that was ordained by God, that's sin. That's immorality. That's in your outline. So listen to this statement then. So when you rob something of its purpose, you empty it of its meaning. Think about that for a second. You get outside of what God originally intended for something and what the purpose was, whatever it is. Whether you, you could talk about all the different things in nature, because you think, well, if it exists in nature, you know, then it's fine. But no, there, nature has a particular order to it. And we can't just go out and decide to just tear down all the trees and the rainforest. You know what I'm saying? We can't just decide we're going to pollute and do all. No! Or you can't take, then we can't take poppy flowers and make opium, you know, and heroin out of it. Was that the original intent of God to do that? No. To take that? Whatever it is, you can break it down as far as you want to go. Or to take, you know, molecular structure and create an atom bomb. Do you think that was the original intent of God to do that? That we could blow each other up in massive? That's taking some things that are, I mean, think about atoms and molecules. That is something that is so far beyond us and we tampered with that. Cloning, whatever else is tampering with our genetics and our DNA. What kind of a line are we walking? We're playing God and thinking it's okay. That, we're taking things outside the original design, the original intent and purpose of God. That is immoral to the core. That's why Satan, when he, when he, he, ha he hates us so much, he hates God so much, he's so anti-Christ, no wonder, you know, the issue of gender and homosexuality and sexuality, because procreation in a man and woman in a family unit, if he can break that down... He knows what a domino effect that will have. We're getting outside of the purpose and the sacredness of what marriage and sex and family, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is. Right? Think about that for a second. You, you rob it of its purpose and then you strip it of its meaning. So now it doesn't, it's not sacred anymore. You don't have to honor it anymore. You don't have to follow this or that or make sure that nothing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything because you robbed it of its original intent. That's what Satan's doing. He's wanting to rob people of their purpose. He's wanting to tempt them. He's wanting to put all these idols and everything else in front of them so that then they don't have meaning in their lives. When you don't have meaning, you're just floating around. You're wandering in the wilderness. No way to anchor yourself. No way to find what direction you're supposed to go. What your destiny is. Isn't that, how can there be any joy? How can there be any hope? <laughs> if nothing has meaning. Because there's no purpose. That's where this generation is at. In many ways. That's why suicide is through the roof. Fentanyl is coming across the border in numbers that we can't even fathom. Apparently it's enough to kill every single American. There's enough fentanyl coming across to kill every single American in this country. 
And once again, you can think about the pornography industry and how many billions of dollars that that brings in. More than every professional sport combined is how much that industry brings in. How much does the NFL itself bring in every year? Just imagine that. Now you combine the MLB, you combine the NBA, and that doesn't compare to how much the pornography industry makes every year. So the thing is, is that the thing is, is that there wouldn't be, it's not an issue of supply if there wasn't a demand. That's right. This is why we've got to be crying out for America. Have mercy. Let a third grade awakening come. We, we, we are drenched in rebellion against God and immorality and idolatry. We have been wandering in the wilderness so far away from our original intent of what this country was founded on, what it was meant to be. It was meant to be a shining city on a hill. That's what they talked about. We, we want to create something where we have religious freedom to where the gospel can go forth. That was, that was what was in the hearts of the founders. Which is in 1 Timothy to say, first of all, pray for your leaders and those that are in authority. Make requests and thanksgiving and petition. Because as your leaders go, so goes the rest of the population. Because the whole deal was that this is good and pleasant in the sight of God so that the gospel, so that the good news can... The whole point is not for us to feel like we're successful, we're the richest, we're most powerful, we have this military prowess, we have this influence or whatever else. The whole point of it, according to the founding fathers and according to the Bible, is so that the gospel, there's an environment where there's peace that's conducive and not oppressive and threatening and intimidating to where the gospel can be preached. That's what it is. So that we can love one another. We can be neighbors. We have, we have attitudes and habits of the heart the founders talked about. Where we have, we have freedom because we have self-restraint. Because freedom can lead to anarchy and can lead to idolatry and all these other things. Unless you have the Holy Spirit that can restrain you. We're not just free to do anything we want whenever we want to whoever we want. That's not what real freedom is. Real freedom is found in purpose and in walking that out in the will of God. That's where freedom is found. That's where joy and satisfaction and fulfillment is found. There's no, it's not found in any other place. So idolatry leads to immorality, and immorality leads to hardness of heart and stubbornness. Putting God to the test. So this is taking God's grace in vain. Once again, operating as if you have a license to sin. This is in your outline here. And that God will wink at it, forgive, and be passive about it. We don't have a passive God. We have a God that came to this earth and died on a cross. That is not passive at all. That is a God who's heavily involved that would suffer and die for us and then give us His own spirit. He's connected to us in a major way. He's given us everything. Yes. And what do we do with it? We take it for granted oftentimes. This is continued ignoring, even mocking of God's law, His ways, and His words. This is becoming desensitized towards sin and toward God. This is what happened with the people. It's what happened. You know? Hey, Moses is gone. We don't know when he's coming back. We're getting restless down here. We left Egypt. We're out here in the wilderness, this desert. We eat the same thing every day. Let's throw a party. Let's build a golden calf. Let's just do whatever we want to do for a while while, mountains, while he's up there. It ain't going to hurt anything. It'll be fine. God will still speak to Moses. We're still his people. Right? That's what happened. It's insane to me, but that's what's in the heart of man, apart from God. <laughs> Apart from submission to Him, apart from His transforming power and work in us, that's what we devolve into every single time. Catholic gold. That doesn't even produce milk. <laughs> or that's, you know, whatever. It's just a shiny trinket. I don't know. You know, and and maybe think about it, what a cow does, right? Maybe that this is, was supposed to be a reflection of them. It just sits there and eats grass, and it goes into this thing, and it comes back, and it's just chewing this grass. It's cut. It's just it's disgusting. 
It's just kind of, that's what we do. The same cut comes back and, oh, I think I'll eat this again. I'll try this again. I'll do this little addiction. I, we're like cows eating our own grass cut junk stuff. I don't even know. You know what I'm talking about. Just chewing on it. Not even, it's not even good. It's just grass. And then it's our own saliva and our own digestive juices. And we're just like, I don't know what's happening. I need to get off of that. But that's what it is. That's what it is. And that's what it should be to us. It should be nasty. It should be like, what the? I'm sure once again, the Lord is just like shaking his head. And like, I love you, but spit that cut out, man. You got something so much better for you. All right. But aren't we seeing the, the, the ignoring, and not just the ignoring of God and His Word and His laws, but the mocking of it? And that's what it says in Psalm 2, that the, the kings of the earth are going to let, let's cast off the restraints of these ancient ideas, of these religious zealots. We need to, because we want to be truly free. We want to evolve into our fullest human potential. And, and religion and the Bible and God is holding us back. That's what it is. That's what it's saying in Psalm chapter 2. And that's what's happening. We know better than God. It's just like Adam and Eve. It just goes right back to that. We'll take the knowledge of good and evil. We'll do it independent from God because we can do it better. We know better. It's the pride of man. It's the Tower of Babel all over again. That's what our government is doing. That's what the New World Order is. It's the Tower of Babel all over again is all it is. It's nothing new or inventive or creative or genius. It's just Satan's tactics. It's just the counterfeit pride thing all over again. And what happens is you become more and more desensitized. You become more and more with your perspective and your stuff and whatever else to all that other stuff, the voice of God. Just fades and fades and fades and fades more into the background. And you're none the wiser because you think everything's great and you're doing all this great stuff. That's what's happening in our nation. A desensitizing <laughs> hardness and stubbornness against God and His ways. We have so much and so much that we take for granted. But when you got idols and you got you know all this other stuff, you know, you just can't see it that way. So what happens in the progression is it leads to bitterness. Idolatry, immorality, hardness, stubbornness into bitterness where they grumbled and complained. What is this then? So this is blame shifting. Once again, what did the people do? Moses, if you just hadn't done this, we'd be fine. I says, if you hadn't taken us out of there, everything, we wouldn't, none of this would happen. Or, hey, man, it's your brother. Why'd you make him the priesthood? Remember, they wanted to come against Moses and Aaron and say, well, you know, we'll take over these duties. They just want to blame shift and whatever else. And that's what happened once again. You go back to the garden. What happened when God confronted them? Came to Adam, the head, the leader, the one that's supposed to take care of things. Hey, man, uh, well, it was the woman that uh, she did it. And what does she say? Well, it was the serpent. It's just continue to shift the blame on. What does our government do? Just continue to shift the blame and kick the can down the road. Until eventually our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren have to pay for that at some point can't just keep making excuses and shifting blame and kicking the can down the road. There's consequences. Somebody has to pay the piper. Yeah. And that's the thing in God's mercy in His long suffering. He'll wait and He'll be patient. And He'll have grace and mercy again and again and again and again and again. But at some point, judgment comes. At some point, the consequences come. You get to choose what you do and say and all that, but you don't get to choose the consequences. Blame shifting, anger and unforgiveness, offense, only seen selfishly. This is what happened with the people. This is what happens in our culture. Only seeing selfishly through the external and focusing on the negative and what you don't have or on disappointments or false expectations. And that's the thing. The reason that you have disappointments is because you have wrong expectations. You expect God to do X, Y, Z, and all you have to do is a shortcut version or this or that, and God should still do whatever it is that you want Him to do. Be the Santa Claus that you want Him to be. So you have wrong and false expectations, and when you have that, it's always going to lead to disappointment and offense. Because God didn't do what you thought He was going to do, when you wanted Him to do it, and how He should have done it. Right? That's what the people were like. Why are we, what's going on here? 
But the whole time, God was trying to father them. The whole time, He was trying to show them what was inside of them. Let them know, you can't do this apart from me. I'm going to give you the law and all, but you have no power to actually fulfill it outside of submitting to me in relationship with me. I'm going to give you the Ark of the Covenant. I'm going to give you all these things where you can enter into right relationship and worship, and I can be, you know, your father. I, I'm going to let you judge yourselves. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you a king. Like, that, that never happened. Was that the original intent of God for them to have a king and all of that? No. It was to be ruled spiritually through judges and through prophets. It wasn't until the people cried out, grumbling and complaining, saying, we want to be like the rest of the world. Give us a king. Right? And Samuel was like, I'm not going to do that. And God said, you know what? Go ahead. Yeah. Let them see what that's like. And ever since then, we've shifted from a spiritual reality of governing to a political reality of governing. And it's been downhill ever since. God is saying, I have, that's why I do have a kingdom, and I have called you to be a kingdom of priests, right? To intercede and to represent me, to bind and loose, and all those different things, to be out there in the, in the different spheres of society, to rule and to reign under my lordship, to bring that to bear on the culture. We've gotten so far away from that ever since that time frame, going all the way back to the Old Testament. And we had hundreds and hundreds of years of getting further and further away from the original intent of God. And that's why we're so jacked up. That's why we've got world war. That's why we've got all these things going on. I know that's intense. I know it's kind of serious, but we need to call a spade a spade. There's reasons why we're here today. It's not, it didn't happen in a vacuum. It didn't happen overnight. It's not random. And it's not because God doesn't care <laughs> or he's not involved. It's because there's been a progression human beings in their rebellion and the consequences have come. But God is wanting to intervene in the midst of all that though, once again, and raise up a different kind of generation to go and take back what the enemy has perverted and twisted. Hello. Purifying the bride. Unifying the bride. Kingdom. Kingdom. His kingdom is He's coming. The king is coming. We're supposed to prepare the way for the king. Not be wandering around in the wilderness and then, oh, wait, he's, he's about to be here. I guess we'll set the table now. All right, let's move on quickly. Hebrews chapter 3. This kind of parallels this particular uh, passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is some good stuff, and we'll go through this really quickly. Hebrews, because that was my main, my main section was to hit that, so the rest of this will flow pretty quickly. Don't doubt me now. Have faith. We got this. We're going together like a choo-choo train on down the tracks. <laughs> chapter 3. Check it, check it, check it. Verse 7 says, listen, today, if you hear his voice. Everybody say today. 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 That's, an, that's an important word. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me as on the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said they always go astray in their heart. Why? They did not know my ways. That's huge right there, isn't it? As I swore in my anger, they certainly shall not enter my rest. Now he goes on to give us an admonition here. Take care, brothers and sisters, that there will not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. So instead of that, instead of hardening your heart and having an unbelieving heart, what does it say? But, thank goodness once again for the butts in the Bible that gets our butts in gear. Here it is. But encourage one another. What does it say? Every day. Do we not need encouragement every single day? Yes, we do. Encourage one another every day as long as it's still called what? Today. So that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. What an interesting phrase, the deceitfulness of sin. You don't necessarily get hardened by sin itself, but by the deceitfulness of sin. That's interesting. I will briefly look at that. So today, this is the point. Today, today, it's about today, it's about his voice, and it's about your heart. That's what it's about. That's it. Today, his voice, and your heart. Who you were, your past, your parents, your background, the mistakes, all of those things. Sure, they shape you, this is in your outline, but they do not define you. Okay? 
They can shape you and that's fine, but they do not define you. What matters now is how you respond to the Lord's voice today. It doesn't matter where you've been, it matters where you're going and who you're becoming. That's what matters and that's what God is interested in, that's what God is invested in. That's it. It's about today. I don't care about yesterday, I care about today. Decision that you make today to respond. What is your response? The thing is, is that tragedies are going to happen, right? I just had uh, an aunt pass away from cancer. Relatively young, the cancer came on, all of a sudden, boom, she's gone in a matter of weeks. Okay? Things are going to happen. Tragedies are going to happen. Unfair things, this fallen, cursed world, things are going to happen. It is. The question is, how do we respond to those things? Not that those things happen. But what is our response? Right? That's the important thing. We can't control all our circumstances. The only thing we can control is our response to those circumstances. We can't live in the past. We can't live in that shame. We can't, no. To come out of that today, what is our present reality and relationship today and every single day? How many, when do you have to pick up your cross, Jesus said? Daily. Daily. Every day. We've all got different crosses to bear in different, in different situations in our lives. How are we doing that? Because here's the thing. It said, if you hear His voice. Have you guys ever heard His voice? Has God ever spoken to you through His Word, through a person, through prayer, through whatever? Yes. Have you heard His voice? Have you seen Him answer prayer? Have you seen His goodness? Have you seen... Come on! If you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Open it up. Be thankful. Worship. Press in. Don't go back. Don't take it for granted. What's happening in your heart today as you're hearing His voice? You're coming to church week in and week out, hopefully. What are you doing with it? So he goes on and he says, they saw my works. And we talked about some of the supernatural things that God was doing in their midst. They saw it for 40 years. And yet they still went astray. So for us, what's the lesson here? We must not become overly familiar. Okay, this is in your outline. Or count it small or take for granted the works that God has done and is doing in our lives. Right? It's not just that God has saved me before and done some good things. I mean, He has multiple times in multiple crucial moments in my life when I was so far gone and undeserving and He did it anyway. And I wouldn't be here today if not for that. But I know there's more. He's not done with me. Right? He's done things and He's going to continue. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not just a miracle worker back in the day when Jesus was on the planet. Miracles still happen today in Jesus' name. Greater works will you do, right? That's the thing. So, in other words, we can't just whatever, church hop and service hop or whatever, and oh, I've heard that sermon before, I've heard that song a million times, you know, whatever, oh yeah, that person's testimony, and all of a sudden, what's happening? That we, can, we cannot get to that kind of place to where we get bored with God. Whenever you start to get bored with God and what He's done and whatever, that is a that is a slippery slope. That I mean, you'll find something not to be bored with. You'll deal with that boredom, and it will not be good. God, see, that's the thing about about consecration that we're going to talk about in a minute and holiness is that you cannot maintain that by just saying I'm just going to grit my teeth and just whatever else I'm going to I'm going to say no to this. I'm going to set this. I mean, that's good. Do that, but unless you find a fascination. With God and the mysteries of God and His kingdom and His heart and His ways. You'll fall off it every single time. And even, even being fascinated, sometimes you will get distracted or whatever else. But that fascination is huge. Don't get familiar. Don't call this, oh, this is Christianity. This is simple. This is... No! Don't get cocky like that. Don't, don't. Don't do it. Don't get bored with God. Let me tell you something. God is infinite. God is limitless. God's word is going to remain forever. Heaven and earth is going to pass away. He's going to bear the marks forever. We're going to sing about the Lamb. We're going to remember the cross. That's going to happen. I don't know about you, but I don't foresee myself being in that sea of glass with that sea of people 
Can we sing a different song? Can we stop singing about the Lamb and the cross? I mean, for real. We're in glory and there's angels. and there's, I mean, that's what it's... We're doing that now. Oh, man, I got a little shiver down my spine on that. I need to be careful. We cannot take on a casual attitude or religious spirit. Once again, that desensitizes us to the heart of God and to the moving of the spirit. We know that God's going to continue to be faithful. and He's going to continue to pour out. So let's not miss out or compromise or get bored. Let's press in for fullness. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. We're, for billions of years, we're going to be discovering things about God and His kingdom. Truly, it's... Uh, it's make up a word. <laughs> Gazillions of years. Eternity is forever, people. It's forever. <laughs> I don't know what kind of prophetic act that was, but there was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God's going to turn it around. That's it. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> we got to go. So what does he say? They go astray because they did not know my ways. Once again, how do we know God's ways? Well, we've experienced His ways before. We've seen how He's intervened and spoken to us and led us before, right? That matters. Having a history of God of trusting Him and submitting Him and letting Him take us through the process in the different seasons. But we know His ways primarily, once again. You know His Word, you know His ways. You don't know His Word, you don't know His ways. He's told us. That's how He knows how dumb and how shallow and how whatever we are. So he said, I'm going to write it down for you. Really plain. And then I'm going to breathe my Holy Spirit on it for you as well. And then I'm going to send my son on the planet for real in flesh. I mean, come on. I'll, I'll even give you dreams and visions. I'll snatch you up to the third heavens like you do with Paul and John and, you know, whatever. We are just without excuse. So let's not, because as soon as you, once again, you get wrapped up in your own life, your own ways, or whatever else, what's going to happen? You're going to go astray. The only way to stop from going astray. What, is it, what does David say? How does a young man keep himself pure? It's by your word. Living according to your word. And so what does it say at the very end there? Wow, well, encourage one another every day so as not to become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. When you're, when you're running with a group of people and have that kindred spirit and have that heart after God that we're pursuing Him, there's something in that. There's a, there's a strength in that. There's a cord that cannot be broken, right? The Bible talks about. There's something that happens that can stir us. We can get another vision. We can get refreshed. We can pray over each other. We're doing this together. We're helping meet each other's needs. We're praying for one another. Whatever it is, something about that. And that's why it says, do not forsake your assembling together as some do. But even as the Lord, he's drawing near. Hey, fervently love one another from the heart is what it says. Fervently love one another from the heart. Otherwise, once again, once again, you got your, your people, your places, your things, right? Who are you hanging out with? Who are you spending time with? What are you letting into your life? What are you listening to? What you, you're going to be influenced by someone or something. The question is, what is it? Is it good or bad? Et cetera. Is it of God? Is it not? We've got to encourage one another every day. Otherwise, that deceitfulness will come in once again. And we'll count it as no big deal. We won't even see it. We won't see it. We won't see the sneak attack of the enemy. Because we don't have other people holding us accountable, giving us their perspective, helping us get to that next level, that next through that next season. That's the thing. If we become an island, we're going to fall every time. Hebrews chapter 3, okay, this is, so we're, we're continuing in Hebrews here. So he goes on towards the end of this chapter. He says, to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? And so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. So these two things are related. Why are you being disobedient? Because you have unbelief. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. You're not believing the right things about who you are and about who God is. 
And as soon as you, 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 you misplace that identity, as soon as you, you misunderstand that relationship, you're going to enter into a, 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 a gray area. There will always be disobedience. So belief and obedience are super tied together. In fact, it goes on in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, we must fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, if any, it, and any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have good news preached to us, just as they also did. But listen to this. But the word they heard did not benefit them. Why? Because they were not united with those who listened with faith. That's the key. You can hear about it. You're here today. You're hearing the truth right now. You're hearing the Bible. You're hearing the Word. But you have to listen with faith. That's the only way you're going to be able to walk out these doors and be able to carry it out. You have to listen with faith. Then you get the empowerment to obey it. That's the thing. And that's crucial. That's huge. Once again, the people of Israel were believing all kinds of crazy things and complaining about all kinds of crazy things. And so they fell into disobedience and rebellion, idolatry and all that other stuff. So we come full circle, don't we? We come back all the way back around on, on how this thing works. I love the Bible. That's fantastic. So once again, our progression of our journey in Christ that we see here in this example, because this was written for our instruction, right? That's the thing. We go from being slaves to sons to soldiers. That's the whole thing. And once you realize, that's the whole thing that you, the whole thing of salvation is that you recognize how gone you are, how lost you are, how great a chasm there is between us and God. We can never earn it. We can never do it. We can never measure up. And you, when you see your wickedness, when you see your selfishness, when you see all of that darkness that's there and how God transferred you out of that darkness into light, how he just poured out mercy and grace, how he forgave and loved us in that way when we were his enemies, not even thinking about him, undeserving. Something happened, something should happen in you that forever marks you, that forever changes you. So he delivered me from that. He changed my heart. He changed my desires. Everything about me. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm never going back to that bondage. God's too good. I've tasted and I've seen. So you go from the slavery thing, and then it goes further than that. It's not like, it's like God's like, okay, good job. You're going to see me one day in heaven. Just hang in there. And doesn't give us anything else besides that. I saved you. You're forgiven. No, I'm your father. You're my son. I've seated my son at the right hand. And everything's under his feet. Guess what? You're seated with him in heavenly places. That's the thing, man. That's what Jesus paid for. Sonship. That's the thing. Some people have a... A taskmaster idea about God. That he's made all these rules and he's made it so hard and he's so whatever, he's so this, he's so severe, he's so blah, 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 blah. And God's mad and he's disappointed and he's this and that. He's not, we're not in a slave mentality anymore. We've got to go into a son mentality. That's the only way. Yes. We need the love of the Father. We need to feel that. We need to know that. It's unconditional. It's everlasting. It doesn't depend on what we say or do or don't say or don't do. It's there because we're His kids. And that's who He is to us. That's who we are to Him. Yes. Period. He's not. He's made up His mind about us. That's the thing. You, know, you think about Misty Edwards and a lot of these songs that she's written over the years. And she wrote that song, you know, that, that, where she talks about, from the Lord's perspective, I knew what I was getting into when I called your name, and I called you just the same. God knows. He knows all our jacked up nature, that we're but dust. So no, but I called you just the same. Well, I knew exactly what I was getting into when I created you and I called you. He's, never gonna, he's already made up his mind forever. That's sealed. That's a done deal. And we can choose to reject that and live in slavery and not enter into that sonship, though. And that's why there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth one day when there's eternal separation from a God who is doing everything in his power to pour out his love and show mercy. 
to take us out of that wilderness. We don't have to stay in the wilderness. There's a promised land. There is a promised land. There's a destiny for us here. There's an assignment. There's things here and now. Eternal life begins now. And there's a progression. Instead of this, this, this bad negative trajectory and progression, there's a glory to glory. There's a kingdom advancement trajectory. And that's what we want to get on as we become a Joshua generation. Amen? Amen. And ultimately, we go to soldiers. So, once again, we can enjoy. We can, we can be satisfied. We can be filled. We can have that love. We can be secure. Right? We have access to the heart of God. The throne of God as sons. And he says, and that's great. And then that, that's got to be a foundational thing. But I want to equip you to not just sit here in my house twiddling your thumbs. I want you to go out of my house and take some land. Yes. Represent me. I'm your dad. You look like me. Go be like me. Amen. Yes. So the thing that had to happen then really quickly with Joshua before they were able to cross that river and go over across the Jordan into the promised land and start to, to defeat the enemies. God said to them, he said, you're going to, here's the, <laughs> it's crazy, but he said, you're going to have to circumcise everybody. Oh. I don't care how old they are, whatever, man, that's what's going to have to happen. Circumcise everybody. And you're going to have to consecrate for three days. Everyone's, you're going to have to be separate. You've got to purify. You've got to get, you got to, no, it's got to, this is a serious deal. You're about to, to this is a transitional moment. You're entering into something, entering into a, a, a major shift in history. For, you're going to become a nation. You're going to have, there's, I mean, this is crazy, right? So there has to be a circumcision. The Bible talks about not just a circumcision of flesh. It talks about a circumcision of the heart. So that's the thing. That's what has to happen. Yeah. Cut away, God, everything that hinders your love and your will in my heart. Yeah. I don't want to be numb. I don't want to be bored. I don't want to be distant. I don't want to be hardened. I don't want to be prideful. I need a circumcision of the heart. I need you to do surgery, Holy Spirit. Yeah. Search me. Try me. Test me. Know me. Lead me in the way everlasting. A circumcision of the heart, man. That's what we need, and that's what had to happen. That's what that represented. And, and it, it talked about how at that place they named it a particular thing, which means God rolled away their shame that day. Rolled away the shame of that 40 years of wandering around with idolatry and all that. I'm going to roll it away. That's what that circumcision was about. I'm rolling away your shame. This is a new time. It's a new day. Go in and take the land. This is who I've created you to be. You're my sons and you're my soldiers. Consecration, you know, this is a huge thing. Once again, that's what I believe with COVID and everything that's, that, that's happened is there's been a place where we've had to be isolated. We've had to think about things. We've had to adjust. We've had to say, what, what's going on? How do we do life? How do we do church? How do we maintain? What is our, how do we be bold? How do we stand? How do we, but also be respectful and, and, you know, whatever. How do we navigate these things? And I believe God's been in a consecration process to say, here's the thing. Church might look different. Things might are going to look different. I'm about to I'm about to do some some new things on the planet. Deal with some, expose some darkness. I'm about to pour out. I'm about to raise up a generation. But you're going to have to be completely set apart. You're going to have to be complete. It's okay to be different. It's okay in this sense to be a rebel. <laughs> you know, Jesus was a rebel. He really was. Jesus didn't just hang out with the outcasts. He was an outcast. And that's what I can't wait to say to this group of kids out at the skate park. I can't wait to say that to them. You feel like you're an outcast? Guess what? Jesus was an outcast. Anyway. But there's a consecration, right? There's something where God's saying, I want to put you in a different context where, yes, there's pressure in this and that, but you have to lean into me. And you have to separate yourself. You have to get with me in a way that is urgent, in a way that is sobering, in a way that is different than before. You're about to cross over and face some battles with some enemies you've never... And he actually says, you've never gone this way before. He says that to them. You've never gone this way before. So what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have the priests and the Ark of the Covenant go before you. Once again, we talked about that with the Tabernacle of David. The presence of God has to be at the forefront. It has to be at the center. The presence of God. That's what we're after. That's who we want to be. A people after the presence of God, after the heart of God. A culture of worship and prayer, that's what it is. 
The ark is going to go in front. The presence of God. That has to be the heartbeat of everything. If we're going to march, we better be marching in tune to the heartbeat of God. He's got to be up front. We've got to follow his leadership. No matter what it looks like, no matter how crazy or off or weird, God has asked people throughout the Bible to do some really weird things. Okay? I'm not saying we're just going to be a bunch of weirdos and flakes or whatever. But he's saying that you've never gone this way before. It's going to be a little uncomfortable. You better get consecrated so that you can go through it. Get your heart pure and try not to worry about your reputation and all that other stuff. And your comforts and conveniences, it's going to be different. Let me cut all that away so that that doesn't affect you when you enter into this new place. Isn't that something? Of course, they went into the river and they took the ark and then the waters piled up, right? So that they could cross over. This rushing river, right? <clears throat> So they went in and, of course, they took possession. That's the thing. There are promises of God. We have a promise wall back here with all kinds of scriptures and words and things that God has spoken over us over the years. But once again, the promises don't happen automatically. The promises happen in partnership. There's some things that God has a part and we have a part. God won't do our part and we can't do his part. <laughs> So we have to take, they had to take possession. This was a promised land. This was a promise of God. This is your inheritance. This is yours. But they had to take possession of it. Why do we think it's any different for us? We have to take possession of the promises of God. Does that make sense? This is why we have to become these soldiers. Because there are battles to face. The enemy is going to resist us every step of the way. But greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. He's equipped us. He's made us for this. We're not slaves and we're not just sons or soldiers. The whole thing that they had to do, they had to trust God. You know, right? Even with Jericho and these impenetrable walls. And he was like, just march around, you know, with the Ark of the Covenant and blow the trumpet. Then do it seven days. And it's like, what's happening here? Why are we doing this? Hey, this is our land. Let's go in. They just had to trust God. And God was like, I don't care about your mighty men and all that. I mean, that's great and all, but you need to know that the battle is mine. And the way that this thing is going to happen is going to be according to my leadership and not your power and not your strength, right? You need to know I'm with you supernaturally. Nothing will be able to stand against you. That's what he told Joshua. No one will be able to stand against you. And he proved it with the first battle of Jericho. The walls came tumbling down. So we got to trust God. We got to stay alert. We got to be prepared. We got to fight the battles. Joshua, let's read this and this is where we'll close. In fact, let's stand as we read this. Let's stand and just honor the word of the Lord here at the very end. I hope this is encouraging you. We can go ahead and have the prayer teams come up. Let's just go ahead and do this in one shot. And I know, Mandy, you had, you had, you had said that you wanted to pray for some of us as leaders, and so we could definitely do that. So leaders, whatever capacity of leadership you're in, whether you're an elder deacon, whatever, Mandy and some of her friends and, and team that go out and, and do different things, uh, works and, and prayers and things in, the, in, uh, in their ministry around all, not just Arkansas, but other states. You can come up here and be ministered to uh, by them here in a minute. We'll let people come for individual prayer and then we'll kind of do that. So if you're, if you're a leader here in this house and you want to just receive just a blessing from them as they pray over us, then hang, hang around a little bit and uh, we'll call you up front in just a minute. So that's awesome. We love, we love Mandy and, and Bill and, and, and uh, I mean, Brandy, all you guys over there. Dara, I mean, you guys are amazing. I'm bad with names, so I can't remember all your names. <laughs> Leah, um, uh, Olivia, was that the other one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I broke through. All right. <laughs> I got to start taking Prevagen. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Lord help. Awesome. Man, what a, what a great day in the Lord, man. Thank you guys. I'm just so blessed to be with you guys once again. It, it is encouraging. I hope you felt strengthened today in the Lord. Because once again, there is a generation that's looking at us. There is a generation that's depending on us. And it's okay to feel the weight of that responsibility. I don't know about you, but that's good for me to feel the weight of that responsibility. That helps keep me. <laughs> keeps me focused. Keeps me on that path. Keeps me driven. I need that. Right? I need that. Pushing me on. Thinking about something other than myself. That's what, I, that's what we need. We're here to serve. That's what we're here to do. Joshua chapter 1, look at this, verse 6 through 9. So this is our commissioning people. If we're going to be a Joshua generation and help this generation come 
into their destiny, into their God-given assignments and giftings and callings. The Lord is with us. Look what the Lord says. Be strong and courageous. Listen, He says that three times. Three times, be strong, be courageous. So He's not just saying, go be that. No, I'm actually going to be with you. I'm going to give you the strength. I'm going to give you the courage. That's the thing. You're not doing this outside of, of me and my spirit. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land. Isn't that what we want? We want to give this generation their rightful place, their possession of their piece of the land, right? We want to see them enter into the fullness of their God-given destiny, which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, he says this time. And this is what he says. He says, be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. So that you may achieve success wherever you go. I don't know about you, but I'm saying, Lord, I, I want that. I want to achieve success in terms of heaven's perspective. Wherever we go, don't turn from the right or to the left. However God is instructing us, speaking to us, promising prophetic words, that's what we need to do according to. And then he says this. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Once again, what did we say last week? We're going to prophesy. We're going to speak life. We're going to speak to the dry bones. It shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it. Now, here's where we can be the cows now. We can, we can do the good thing now. But it has to be on the word of the Lord. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then, he says it again, then you will make your way prosperous. And it says, you will. God's saying, I'm handing it to you. I'm with you and for you and all. If you'll do these things, then you'll make your own way prosperous. I'm going to back you up. Right? That's the thing. As you have faith and you believe and you step out in obedience, you will make your way, your way prosperous. Because what does the Lord say? He said, I'll go before you and I'll be your rear guard. All of that. And then you will achieve success. Have I not commanded you? Once again, I've commanded you, so therefore I'm going to give you the power to carry out my command. That's what grace is. A divine enablement to do what we cannot do in and of ourselves. And here he says it again. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified nor dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And that's what we want as we journey out to our city and these different things. We want the fragrance of Christ to be released. We want the revelation knowledge of Jesus Christ. We want the love of the Father to be poured out on sons and daughters. That's what success is. <laughs> Not that we get a bunch of big name and a big church service and this and that and whatever, but that people are added to the kingdom. People's lives and hearts are changed presence of God is being released. People are being revived and renewed. Prodigals coming home. We don't have anything that says do not be terrified or dismayed. In other words, maybe we've had disappointments. Maybe it fell short. Maybe we messed up. Maybe we got off track. Maybe whatever it is. He says don't be dismayed. Don't be afraid. The world is being consumed with fear. We're in the world, but we're not of the world, right? There's a higher reality, a superior kingdom.